The listening part of Occupational English Test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 24. has been referred by her GP due to a history of endometriosis. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look through the notes. start off by asking you a few questions. How old are you? Uh, I'm 22. Are you married? No, but I live with my partner. Have you ever been pregnant? No. And when was your last cervical smear? Um, uh, that would have been done when I went to see my GP, mm -hmm. probably three months ago now. It was all normal. Okay, great. Now I gather you've had some pelvic pain recently. Yes, that's right. Uh, it started in February of this year, a sharp pain in the left side of my stomach. It usually came on a few days before my period and then seemed to settle down at the end of my period. After February, the pain got really bad and it wouldn't go away. I was admitted to hospital. Oh dear. Yeah, the consultant there performed a laparoscopy and it revealed that on my left ovary and behind my room, I had endometriosis. After that, he suggested that I should take That's right. Uh, it started in February of this year, a sharp pain in the left side of my stomach. It usually came on a few days before my period and then seemed to settle down at the end of my period. After February, the pain got really bad and it wouldn't go away. I was admitted to hospital. Oh dear. Yeah, the consultant there performed a laparoscopy and it revealed that on my left ovary and behind my room I had endometriosis. After that, he suggested that I should take the pill without a break. But the pain didn't get any better, so he started me on progesterone tablets, which made me feel horrible. I put on weight and felt bloated all the time. I also developed acne. I hadn't had that since I was a teenager, but the pain still didn't get any better. So the consultant readmitted me in May of this year and performed another laparoscopy and treated the endometriosis with a diatomy. After that, I was much better and the pain almost completely went away. That was until August when it returned. Uh, it's been slowly getting worse since then, and again, as in the beginning, it's in my stomach and it hurts just before my periods. Only now the pain is there at all different times, and it really hurts when I'm having intercourse, especially in certain positions. Right, I see. And are your periods regular? Yes, regular because I'm taking the pill again with a week's break. The last one was about three weeks ago. What about any other health concerns? No, everything else is fine. I've never been a smoker, but I do like a drink at weekends. Just one or two, though. Nothing crazy. My family are all well, too. No serious illness in either my mum or dad or in my older sister. Nothing else I can think of, really. And do you have any problems passing urine or with your bowel motions? No, that's all good, too. 
All right, Miss Wells. I think it would be sensible to have a look at you and run some tests. Then we can chat about how to take things forward. But from what you've told me, my initial suspicions are that the endometriosis might have come back. That's what I was afraid of. Since I was first diagnosed, I've been doing a lot of reading, so I was really worried when the pain returned. I'd like to be able to have children in the future, and I'm worried it might be difficult with the endometriosis. I really don't want to be one of those women who ends up having problems getting pregnant. I'm also really sick and tired of the pain. It's beginning to feel like I'll be stuck with it forever. I can tell it's starting to affect my mood. Just ask my boyfriend. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Alexander, the physical exam's very consistent with some very bad back spasming, causing the pain you're in today. Oh, I am in a lot of pain. I've been in a lot of pain for a little over a week now. Yeah. Oh, that's why I went to the emergency yeah. ward, because it just was unbearable. So, yeah. And I'm not sleeping well, neither, from this. Yeah, it's ex you're exhausted. I am, yeah. extremely. Well, this back pain, we can treat with some uh, medication for the pain, some, uh, something for the back spasm as well, uh, exercises, and uh, a heating pad to make you feel better. Uh, most of the time, back pain will get better uh, with this conservative treatment. Well, that sounds nice, doctor. I mean, it sounds okay, but what I was thinking is that maybe I should have an MRI done because uh, I've think maybe something seriously is going on with my back, so... Tell me about that. Well, I'm concerned that something is uh, seriously wrong, like I may have a pinched nerve or a um, slipped disc or something, and I figured an MRI could at least show if that's what's going on or roll it out, and, you know, it'd be sort of like a peace of mind thing for me as well, so... Yeah, yes. Uh, I could see you're worried about it, and I, I would be too, but I have to tell you, uh, the physical exam today shows nothing more than the back spasm. It has none of these red flags we worry about, um, such as the weakness in the leg, uh, problems with the reflexes, or anything with this neurologic exam. It all came back normal today. Um, you had no fever in the history and no uh, problems that, uh, besides the pain that you're having from the lifting that you described. I know you're in a lot of pain um, and you're worried about it, uh, but most of my patients get better with this conservative treatment. Is there something else you're worried about? Uh, well, like I said, you know, it's been a problem for over a week now and I'm really concerned that something is wrong and that I'll never be able to work again or I'll be disabled yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, doctor, look, I, I did some research on my, you know, on my own. I, I went uh -huh. on the internet. I was reading up about, you know, what people do for their back pains and, and I saw this guy, actually I saw a couple people uh, who swear that after an MRI their back feels a lot better. Something to... Uh, to do with the magnetisms, I believe it's in the machines or something, okay. and I hear people using magnets to, you know, to help with back issues and other pains. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, well, you know, I can find out if something seriously is going on with the MRI, and at the same time maybe feel better because of the magnets that are, you know, going on in the machine. So that's why I'm asking you to uh, give me a referral so I can get an MRI done. Yeah. I know you want to get better, I, I feel that from you, uh, but the yeah. MRI has not been shown in the past to help alone, the magnetism. Uh, that's not something that it actually does. It's an imaging study, it just shows what's there. Um, you mentioned you wanted an MRI while we were doing the uh, physical, so I pulled out some uh, information for you about it. All right. uh, 
because the MRI um, can cause some harm. And uh, we don't want to do that. It's unnecessary uh, when you have this type of spasming pain. Um, a study shows that with people who get uh, MRIs within the first month of having back pain are eight times more likely to have surgery. And I don't think you're a candidate or we want you to have surgery at this point. No, I, I don't want surgery at this point. I don't want surgery at any point. Right. I just want my back to get better. And so I figured... You know, this MRI could, yeah. you know, show me if, you know, anything's going on and maybe the magnets would help, but you're saying that that's pretty much no, a myth. No, I see back pain a lot. And most of my patients get better within four to six weeks with this conservative treatment we mentioned with the medication and exercises and heat. What do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't look like you're going to give me an MRI referral, so, um, I mean, I'll try it. But if yeah. it doesn't work or if I have other symptoms going on, could we consider an MRI then? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I want you to get better. Sure. And I really think this is going to help you get better. And you will get better. Uh, and if not, I want you to call me. And I want to see you again in a few weeks to make sure you're getting better. That is the end of Part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers. Listening part B. You hear two doctors discussing a patient. Now, read the question. Listening part B, you hear a dietitian talking to a patient. Now, read the question. There are reasons the doctor talked to you about being on a diet that's low in fat. I know, but I like salami, cheese and chips. A meal's not a meal without bread and butter. Mm, I can understand that it's hard for you. I myself have tried to eliminate nearly all the fat from my own diet, and it is difficult to give up the things we love so much. What foods have you had to give up? Well, ice cream was my favourite. I used to have a bowl of it almost every night. But there's been others, butter, sausages, 
Look, no one's saying that you can't eat fatty foods occasionally, but you really do need to try and reduce your overall fat intake if you want to start feeling better. Here, let's look at a possible meal plan. It'll give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. Listening part B, you hear a professor of emergency medicine giving a presentation to a group of trainee doctors. Now, read the question. European wasps feed on meat and meat products such as dog food and barbecue scraps. They also like to scavenge sweet food and drinks and steal honey from beehives. Their stings are not barbed like bee stings. This means a single wasp can sting repeatedly. The toxins in the sting will cause a powerful reaction and in some people an allergic reaction. Because they are attracted to food, many wasp stings are in or around the mouth. These are the most dangerous places for a sting, as swelling can result. Minor reactions include painful swellings on the lips, while in severe cases, there can be a blockage of the trachea due to swelling, and in the most severe cases, this can even lead to death. Listening part B, you hear a GP talking to a regular patient who has been having kidney problems. Now read the question. Okay, 
Okay, John, now that we've established you're not going to be playing sport, here's what you're going to need to do for the next two to four weeks. Okay, first of all, you're going to have to wear a neck brace. You can get one in the shop down the ground floor. You won't wear that at night, right, when I'm sleeping. Well, you can, but you don't have to. Okay, one thing that will help you with the pain is a nice pack for 10 to 20 minutes, followed by a nice warm shower. Okay, um, I'll still probably be working a bit. We don't have a shower there. If you're at work, you can just use a warm cloth instead. Another really good thing to do is neck and back stretches. We can go through them now if you like. Okay, great. Listing part B, you hear a specialist physician and a nurse discussing a patient's treatment. Now, read the question. Uh, nurse, hello. I'm wondering if you can help me. I've just been going over the charts for Mr. Chu in bed 34, and I'm wondering why I wasn't told that his blood pressure medications were being held over the past few days. Hi, Dr. Griezmann. Right, I'm not sure. I didn't even know that had happened. Let me look into it and I'll get back to you. Well, there's no need for that. I've been sitting here for 20 minutes looking at the blood pressures and medications that have been given to the patient, and it simply doesn't make any sense. Well, I really don't know, Dr. Griezmann. I've literally taken care of this patient for four hours. I can discuss it with the nursing director, though, if you like. No, that isn't necessary. Thank you, nurse. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. That medicine physician, Dr. Carly Dugan, giving a presentation about improving health literacy and patient outcomes through communication. You now have 90 seconds to read questions one to six. Dugan. 
I'm an emergency medicine physician and a researcher. I'd like to talk to you today about the importance of <coughs> consumer engagement in health, an area which has been widely acknowledged in recent years as playing a crucial role in achieving the best possible health outcomes for patients. As health professionals, our clients or patients come to us with various levels of education or literacy, and they may prefer to speak a different language, and these issues can become barriers for them to understand health information. This, essentially, is the issue of health literacy, which is defined as the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services, make appropriate healthcare decisions, or act on health information, and the ability to access or navigate the healthcare system, which we all know is extremely complicated. Any client who does not read or write well, has trouble understanding verbal or written communication about health, speaks a different language, or has trouble understanding or using numbers could have trouble with these areas. Studies show that patients immediately forget 40 to 80 percent of medical information provided to them by healthcare providers, and my own research clearly indicates that health literacy is a strong predictor of health status. Patients with low health literacy have more difficulty recalling health information, and inadequate health literacy can lead to numerous negative effects on an individual's health and well-being, including poor self-care, increased utilization of health services, worse outcomes, and decreased likelihood of receiving preventative care and services. Poor communication by health professionals with patients also contributes to unnecessary readmissions. In response to surveys that have indicated high rates of poor health literacy, Governments and national agencies in countries as diverse as the U.S., China, Australia, and some European nations have now gone on to develop national strategies and targets to improve health literacy in their populations. Health information can be confusing, even for those with advanced literacy skills. It's easy for those of us working in healthcare to forget that we speak our own language that patients can't always easily understand. Most of us can recall times when we believed that we had shared information with a patient and family member or caregiver and believed they understood our instructions, only to later discover confusion or misunderstanding. Communication breakdowns in the chain of care are also a leading factor in preventable disability and death. I teach a session on health literacy at a local college and share examples from my own time in practice. One example I like to share with my students is a study in which researchers ask patients what they know about diuretics, better known to some of you as fluid pills. 52% of the respondents researchers interviewed believed that fluid pills caused fluid retention instead of alleviating it. Another example I use is a story of a patient who was informed that she had Graves' disease and burst into tears because she thought the doctor was telling her she was about to die. This kind of confusion is understandable, but may also be avoidable if we take some extra care with our communication with patients and family caregivers. Regardless of a patient's health literacy level, it is important that as healthcare professionals, we ensure that patients understand the information they have been given. The teach back method is one way of checking understanding by asking patients to state in their own words what they need to know or do about their health. It is a way to confirm that we have explained things in a manner our patients understand. A pediatrician I recently did some work with told me, I decided to do teach back on five patients. With one mother and her child, I concluded the visit by saying, so tell me, what are you going to do when you get home? She could not tell me what instructions I had just given her. So I explained the instructions again, and then she was able to teach them back to me. I had absolutely no idea she did not understand the first time. I was so wrapped up in delivering the message that I did not even realize it wasn't being received. Research clearly shows that consultations that include checking patients' recall and understanding do not take any longer than consultations that don't, and they help prevent future unnecessary health service use. It is therefore essential that as we continue to work on improving the safety and reliability of care, we consider deficiencies that contribute to patient harm beyond the obvious focus on acute care and ambulatory settings to include how we communicate with patients about their treatment plans and their health. 
ensuring that we are communicating clearly and delivering information at the appropriate literacy level will be an important step. is Dr. Jan Marshall, Associate Dean of Medical Education at the University of Glasgow Medical School. In light of a new report that's recently been published on the subject, we're talking today about saturating facts. So, Dr. Marshall, can you tell us what the difference is in how many experts view fat now versus 30 years ago? Sure. The low fat era is finally starting to come to an end. The 2015 UK Dietary Guidelines did for the most part, exonerate fat and cholesterol with no restrictions on total fat or cholesterol in diet. That is after 35 years of previous guidelines advising a low fat and low cholesterol diet. I think there's still a lot of misinformation floating around about saturated fats. Not all saturated fats are bad, and they're somehow being all been grouped together and labelled as harmful, so there's still some work to do there. Can you talk a little more about the relationship between saturated fat and cholesterol levels? Yeah, sure. We spent most of the last generation looking at total cholesterol and LDL, as if to suggest that these two values give you an accurate reflection of what we now know to be a much more complex and nuanced issue with lipids. But, when you get people fat from a quality source and lower their carbohydrates, generally you see their triglycerides come down. That's a good thing. You see, their good cholesterol, the HDL, goes up. That's a really good thing. What you see in the majority of people when you give them a more saturated fat is a shift from the small, dense LDL particles. These are the more risky, inflammatory, arthrogenic types of LDL to a larger, more buoyant LDL particles, which are less inflammatory. Many physicians still aren't aware of this. And what are your views on saturated fat and its place in the diet? Well, quality becomes paramount here. The saturated fat in a fast food bacon cheeseburger will have an entirely different effect than the saturated fat in coconut oil. I absolutely love healthy saturated fats in coconut oil and grass-fed butter, and I think these have a place in our diets. Healthy saturated fats can actually help you burn fats, they make your brain work better and faster, they make your skin glow, and they can help optimise your cholesterol profiles. It's very important that you only include saturated fats in the context of a diet that is very low in refined carbs and sugar. Saturated 
fortified with coconut oil. I absolutely love healthy saturated fats like coconut oil and grass-fed butter, and I think these have a place in our diets. Healthy saturated fats can actually help you burn fats. They make your brain work better and faster. They make your skin glow, and they can help optimize your cholesterol profiles. It's very important that you only include saturated fats in the context of a diet that is very low in refined carbs and sugar and includes omega-3 fats. The entire LDL lowering hypothesis has been questioned by recent studies that have found that those who have LDL lowered the most by vegetable oil have the greatest risk of heart attack or death. Are you saying we should embrace saturating fat and stop worrying about cholesterol? No, I'm actually not suggesting that. The saturated fat in your diet has very little correlation to the saturated fat in your blood, but we do know that the higher saturated fats in your blood are linked to heart disease. The question is how do you get high saturated fat in your blood? Logic would dictate that it's by eating eating butter, but biology is not so straightforward. It is by eating sugar and refined carbs. Low fat, High carb diets trigger synthesis of this type of blood saturated fats that are linked to heart disease. Why is nutritional science often so contradictory and confusing? Well, there is contradictory information because the research is hard to read, and of course, if a study is being performed or funded by someone who has a strong opinion, the outcome is more likely to favour that opinion. A lot of experts are also looking at outdated research. These are studies in which people who are eating fats are eating bad fats, inflammatory fats, and junk foods. Well, of course, you would think that fat is bad for you if you're only looking at a study like that. So it often comes back to an individual's understanding of the research. And why do a lot of organisations and experts still push a no-fat or low-fat message? Yes, I think that's such an important question. I've been in practice almost 30 years and I have had very academic roots all along. The structures and organisations and associations that we look to for guidance and advice are not nimble at all. These are run by good people, but there's an inherent bias that these structures tend to embrace. We all know that there are researchers who will lose grant support overnight if they suddenly change from saying fat to bad. They will struggle to maintain their academic integrity based on the culture that they're in. In all of this debate over fat, and saturated fat in particular, I still recommend filling your plate with at least 75% phytonutrient-rich, colourful, non-starchy veggies. Plant foods, by volume, should take up the majority of your plate.